Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our Managing Finance on Salesforce webinar. Um, I'm going to hand over to David Riles, who's going to take you through the webinar now. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's well. Hope everybody's having a good morning. Um, thanks for joining us on this webinar uh, about managing finance on Salesforce. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen and can hear me properly. Um, okay, so today's webinar, okay, is um, is obviously myself and Sam Brennan uh, are going to be doing the webinar today. So myself, I'm the principal lead consultant at Xenogenics. Um, I've been with Xenogenics now for two and a half years. Um, and Sam, would you like to just do a quick introduction of yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sam Brennan. Um, I'm Solution Entry at Financial Force. Um, I have been with Financial Force for six years now, um, and I originally started in the consultant team. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping first. So just some, some quick rules in terms of uh, how we're going to be interacting today. So um, as we're running through the webinar today, if you've got any questions at all, um, please just type them in the chat box. We'll receive the questions and then at the appropriate time, um, we will either interrupt the web, either interrupt a demo or um, at the end of the demo, we'll have some time for more questions afterwards as well. Okay. Um, okay. So let me tell you a little bit about Xenogenics. So obviously some people on the call are familiar with Xenogenics and have worked with Xenogenics before. Uh, and some people are going to be new to Xenogenics. So, so Xenogenics are an experienced Salesforce partner. Uh, we have over 200 successful solution implementations. Um, and, and really, uh, the, you know, sort of the main focus for us is customer satisfaction. We have a very high customer satisfaction score with Salesforce, and it's something that we, we uh, take a lot of pride in. Um, we have a number of strategic partners, obviously Salesforce themselves and Financial Force, but also Elements, Conga and Cloud Coach. Uh, and we can do solution design and app implementation, obviously with sales, sales cloud, service cloud, uh, CPQ as well, Pardot, communities and field service lightning. So let me just do a quick introduction about Financial Force and what the Financial Force suite's all about, okay? So Financial Force is the customer-centric ERP. Um, it's made up of five main modules, okay? And we're gonna be obviously looking at some of those modules today, okay? So obviously the main and most obvious one, the one that's probably drawn everybody in today is gonna to be accounting and finance. Uh, and within that module, that is where you're going to find, you know, your sort of standard accounting functionality, um, you know, things like obviously invoicing and journals, etc. all of your reporting. Okay. Uh, there's another module called subscription and usage billing, uh, which deals more around complex contracts and renewals and contract amendments. Uh, and obviously, you know, raising invoices, invoice consolidations, things like that. Okay. Uh, revenue recognition and forecasting, which deals with complex revenue recognition, um, allows you to apply different revenue recognition profiles to different items uh, and, and really can help you automate that side of your business. Um, the next one is procurement and procurement and order and inventory management. So this allows you to set up a workflow around purchase ordering and obviously pushing that data into the accounting system, but also allows you to do some inventory management. So, you know, keeping stock, bills and materials, you know, and some light manufacturing. And then finally, professional services automation. So also referred to as PSA. So PSA really allows you to sort of automate or semi-automate management of projects um, and keep a view on, on project process. All of these apps um, can be used in conjunction with each other, but it's also worth pointing out, may, may be applicable to people or may not, but they can actually all be used individually. They don't need to, you know, you don't need to have accounting and finance, for example, to use PSA. Um, they can actually all be purchased and used separately. Now, in terms of the demo today, we are going to be focused on accounting and finance 
Um, there's going to be some demo of subscription usage billing and some demo of revenue recognition and forecasting. This is going to be a whistle stop tour today. We've only got about 40 minutes scheduled for the demo. Um, you know, sort of a full demo of the financial force suite could probably last a day if you really wanted it to. Um, but, uh, but obviously we don't have that amount of time. So what we're doing is just a high level, just let you guys see what the platform looks like get some kind of an idea as to whether or not it might be a right fit for you. And then obviously we can pick that up with you later if it's something you want to take further. Okay, so what kind of businesses use financial force? So the most obvious one is Salesforce CRM businesses. So these are businesses that are using Salesforce. They've captured a lot of their data already in Salesforce. Um, and they're looking to leverage that data, possibly from Sales Cloud, to you know sort of automate or semi-automate their finance function, um, and, and stop having to replicate the data. You know, uh, get rid of potential data entry errors, etc. Okay, another kind of business that um, might use financial force would be a business which has a high volume of transactions. So perhaps that business doesn't have many revenue streams, maybe it has two or three revenue streams. Um, but, but what it's actually looking to do is, um, because it has a, a large amount of transactions within each of those revenue streams, you know, manual data entry can be very time intensive, very expensive. And so you know, they might be looking for a solution that can heavily automate for them. Another type of business would be a business that has a requirement for revenue recognition or subscriptions. So a great example of that would be, you know, maybe a software business um, which has licenses um, and support, something along those lines, um, and they might bill up front. So, you know, they might need to recognize the software in one way. They might need to, um, you know, recognize the um, support contract in another way, and then they might have ongoing subscriptions as well. And so financial force will allow you to capture that kind of when you actually win the opportunity, when you actually win the contract um, and just let that automate. And, and then you can just manage it as opposed to having to go in and you know, figure out when you've got to create invoices, et cetera. Um, another type of business would be consultancy. So this is specifically around um, professional services automation, PSA module. Um, so businesses that need to track time and materials, um, businesses that are, you know, that have milestone projects. Um, so yeah, and uh, and then yeah, other types of businesses. So businesses with a heavy customization requirement. So those of you that are familiar with Salesforce will know that Salesforce can be heavily customized, uh, and obviously that goes with Financial Force as well. So if you're a business that has a, you know, perhaps a, a very um, individual workflow which can't normally be captured in other software or if it can be it's expensive to you know to to build um, with salesforce you know customization on the salesforce platform is actually quite cost efficient okay and then the final one that i just wanted to highlight here are high growth businesses so businesses that are looking to scale quickly um, perhaps businesses that are looking uh, to be acquired at some point they're looking for a, a sort of best of breed um, platform that can you know potentially actually help them increase their business valuation but also you know businesses who are looking to you know invest now in software so that they don't have to keep investing in extra people as their business grows okay and so what what benefits do we get from using financial force so single version of the truth so this is a this is a really important one you know getting everything onto the salesforce platform basically what it means is that you're going to be levy you know you can potentially be leveraging sales data to create finance data uh, when you create the finance data it's linked back up to the sales data um, and so you know you you know that what you're looking at in finance relates directly to, to sales uh, and you haven't got to go all over the place to get all of your, you know, to get your data, to do your reconciliations. You don't have people in sales arguing with people in finance about values of certain deals, etc. cetera. Um, maximizing automation, already touched on that. Um, you know, basically Salesforce platform gives us a lot of opportunity to 
to automate. There's a lot of automation built into Financial Force already. Um, and so we can, you know, we can automate a lot of the finance function now. Um, minimizing spreadsheets. So, you know, most businesses here will probably have, unfortunately, business critical spreadsheets. Obviously, there's a lot of risk with that. Um, everybody knows they shouldn't do it, but everybody does it. But there's no better, you know, that possibly with current systems, there's no better way, there's no alternative than to use spreadsheets to manage the business. But with financial force, you know, the, the platform built with that in mind, and you know, you shouldn't actually have a need to be managing your business on spreadsheets. Um, robust, robust audit trail from lead to cash, you know, touched on that one earlier as well. If you've got a workflow that runs all the way through from lead to cash and all the data is linked, you can literally find any financial record you want and you can see, you know, from a relationship, you can see exactly how it was created, what it was created from, you can see why it was created as well. So you don't have to be trawling between a number of different systems trying to do reconciliations. Um, you can run a more predictable business as well. Um, you know, Directly linking the finance data to Salesforce can be daunting for some businesses. Um, you know, we, we've seen that in the past, uh, but what it actually means is that you're forced to review processes in sales, make sure the sales data is captured more, more cleanly um, and more accurately. Um, if there is an issue, it gets, uh, gets identified earlier. And then because you've got more accurate data across the whole platform and it's all on one platform, then reporting is a lot easier. You can see what you know what direction your business is going in, and um, you know, and, and it helps you obviously with forecasting. Okay, and then you know, the final one is because Financial Force is on the number one cloud business platform. You know, Salesforce is a, you know, it's a, a massive success story. It really is the uh, you know the sort of the cloud application which started the whole cloud revolution. It's still growing at 20% per year. Um, so, you know, Salesforce is going absolutely nowhere. Um, and anybody who invests in Salesforce, really, you know, they've, they've got a lot of time ahead of them that they can, uh, you know, sort of maximize their investment. Okay, right. So um, I think I've said all I wanted to say there. Like I say, just very, very brief and very high level, very generic um, kind of value around financial force. Um, I think everybody really came here to, to see a demo, to see the actual product. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Sam. Um, so Sam, would you like to go ahead and, uh, and demo for us, please? Sure. Okay, so you can hear me, you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so um, the agenda for the demo today, we've just got five things that we want to cover. So... Um, the first item is we're just going to give a background between like Financial Force and Salesforce, how they connect together, a bit of the home page and navigation. The second section is billing collections. The third is revenue recognition. And then we're going to move into accounts payable and the AP side. And then hopefully end on some good stuff like reports and Einstein. So um, at Financial Force, one of our core kind of um, fundamentals is transparency. So this disclaimer here is that you basically can't make any buying decisions on future features or functions, but we're not going on any futures um, today, so that should be okay. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into the org now. Um, so I'm in the Salesforce org, and I'm actually logged in um, into the accounting app. So Salesforce and Financial Force, you log into one place. It's not two separate systems. It's not two separate logins. So what I mean by this is I'm logged into the accounting app, but if just using this waffle here is all the other apps that are in Salesforce. So like if you use sales app, services app, the marketing app, and then all the financial force apps, they're all in this kind of one, one place and um, one area. What's powerful about this is obviously you can kind of get your sales and finance all in the same place. So for example, if you just look at this home screen here, I'm, I'm sat as a CFO and I'm on a CFO dashboard. Down the left hand side, I can see the sales pipeline per stage and what I expect to come in. I can also see the top 10 deals of what's coming down the line. And then just literally right next to it, I've got a simple multi-company report so I can see what the uh, net income is per company. I've got AR aging, operating expenses, 
and I've got some ARR stuff as well. So all within that one screen, I've kind of got a holistic view of the whole kind of company. Again, I'm not sure how many of you use Salesforce at the moment, um, but I'll just give kind of a background um, into how this works. So at the top in the accounting app, I've got the tabs that I think are important to me um, for my role. You can change these really easily just by, by that pencil. So each user can have their own tabs at the top, which is kind of what their own role needs. At the bottom here, we've got some kind of what we call quick links. So for example, um, if you click on the reporting links, you can have your, you know, your top 10 reports, for example, saved there. So within one click, you can get straight to them from the homepage. You can do the same. So a AR functions, AP functions, you just click on there and it'll bring it all up. Um, and that's really useful just to keep of ease instead of having to go through some kind of, uh, you know, five clicks, it's one click from the home page. It is worth saying that all of these dashboards are drillable and they will drill down into a report. So for example, I'll use the AR aging. Uh, this one's quite cool because it's just um, a set number of uh, 92 million and it's in bold red. So as a CFO, I know when it's in bold red, uh, there is some issues with AR aging and I need to start getting traction on it, understand why, understand why people aren't paying. Maybe if it was below 50 million, let's say, or even just, you know, 5,000 um, for numbers, it might go yellow or green. And I know if it's yellow or green, not to kind of worry about it that much. But when I'm logged in and it's bold red, I then need to start doing something about it. From there, I can drill down and within one click, like I said, it drills down into the underlying report of what the dashboard is showing. So what's loading here is the AR aging. As you can see, the brackets are sat there, but underneath are all the transactions. So for example, if I was like, oh, actually, I'm going to try and get these 61 to 90 days. Let's try to collect these before it goes to 90 days. I can then click on there and it filters the report just by the 61 to 90 days. And you can see there's two or, two or three kind of big ones there. So I'll be like, we'll say, right, we need to start chasing this Westinghouse Limited up. We need to get them to pay right now. And all of that was in one, it was in two clicks from this home screen that I can get right down to them transactional le levels, look at what the account is. And that's kind of the power of Salesforce and financial force together. Another example of this is I just want to go to an actual customer account. Um, so I'm, lo I'm looking at the customer account primer tech. We use the same account as Salesforce does. So we don't duplicate any account records. You don't have um, sales having one list of their own contacts and finance having a separate list and you're having to maintain them. And you actually don't know who the best contact is. Um, it's all within kind of one space. So again, it's that kind of customer centricity. Um, and then hopefully you can actually improve your own customer experience um, for your own customers. Just going to go through this account page and um, what we have at the top is the related list. So everything that's connected to this account, you can see straight away. So, for example, all your opportunities that are connected to it, all your sales orders, if you have any cases, they're all up there. But in exactly the same space, you've got all your invoices that are um, created all your credit notes. Uh, maybe if you've got any contracts related to them, they're all in that one space. So you have that kind of, again, that holistic view of the customer and you know what is outstanding, what isn't outstanding. Going down on the account page, uh, there's some simple standard Salesforce um, fields, but we also put in here an account balance. So we put in the, their own AR agent, so you, you can have an AR agent per customer, and we also put in um, company. So per your legal entity, you can see the account balance for that customer um, if you deal with them in multi-entities. The other great thing is um, some credit limits here and some credit kind of information. So you can set a credit limit, uh, you can have a credit manager. So if you have different credit managers in your, in your um, business, you can assign them accounts and they can keep on top of kind of collections and things like that. Um, some other really cool stuff is these down here. So average days to pay and DSO, these can be automatically calculated. Um, so you can actually do some kind of cash flow forecasting going forward. Um, and, based on the average days to pay. From here as well, you can use like standard Salesforce workflow tools. So for example, if they were really bad payers or they've gone over their credit limit, you can put the account on hold, you can alert the sales team straight away saying these are bad payers, don't sell them anything else. Or 
um, you can basically say, oh, while you're actually trying to get that deal in, can you tell them to pay, pay the invoice? And you can have them really good conversations between the front office and the back office. And this is kind of getting um, into a kind of a different realm where you can actually make the back office a growth platform and it can make the decisions up front for the sales team, um, which again is really kind of powerful. So I've gone over the item one there, which is kind of some user experience, some navigation. We've been on the homepage and account. So I'm now going to move into the billings to collections piece. So if I'm going to, I'm going to go on to an opportunity. So again, I'm not sure how many of you use Salesforce, but the opportunity is a Salesforce record. Um, so this is not financial force, but because we're so closely aligned and we're built natively on the Salesforce platform, we actually start our, um, start our journey up at the opportunity stage. So this is where a salesperson will fill in, uh, you know, information, what they're actually selling, and they might add kind of the four products that are, they're actually going to sell today. As soon as, you know, they've signed the contract, it might go through CPQ process. It might, you know, they might just say, yes, we're happy for it today. It can go into the stage closed run. And that this is the salesperson actually changing this to closed run. So you just press save. At the same time as saving this as closed one, what it will do in the background for us is actually create the billing contract automatically. So again, it's no extra steps. It's nothing like that. The billing contract is created straight away. Um, obviously, those with kind of finance audit head on them, yes, you can put approvals in there. Yes, you can have stage gates so sales aren't um, in power of when the contract is cr created. Um, but what we're trying to do here is get automation right. Um, so again, you can put as many steps in as you want, or you can have it all automated. So if we just move over to this contract now, um, I haven't input any information on here. So it's all been automatically created from that opportunity. So as long as the information up front is correct, which is where you're going to have to kind of put the power, uh, the contract in the background is correct. So I'll just activate this contract and then we'll go through some of the fields just so you can understand how our subscription billing works, what the options are, et cetera. So from here, um, sorry, we'll just wait for this to load just because I've activated it. So from here, the left hand side, we've got the contract header information. So you've got a contract number. This is a unique identifier. And then you've got the contract name, which actually copies from the opportunity name. You have that lookup always to the account. So wherever in the system you have that kind of blue link underlined, you're one step away from going to that. So if I clicked on there, it would send me back to that Primer Tech account where I can look at if there's any other opportunities coming down the line, if there's any other invoices outstanding, et cetera. And it's all linked together, which is fantastic. You've got the options here of start date, end date, and first build date. So the start date and end date is obviously the contract length. But the first build date could be separate to the start date if you wanted it to be. And this is kind of really powerful because this can actually separate your billing compared to your revenue recognition. So if you bill a month in advance, a month in arrears, three quarters in advance, etc., it gives you the ability to do that, but know when you actually want to recognize that revenue based on your contract duration. The proration policy that we've applied here is actual days and billing period. Um, and you can have this set automatically. You can set these up yourself based on how you pro rata stuff, um, or you don't have to use them. Uh, basically, what the proration policy does is, like here, it's starting mid month. Um, it will do a, it'll do a pro rata invoice for um, November, but then December will be a full invoice, January will be a full invoice, so will February, so on, and then the last month as well, it'll do pro rata for the last month. So it can automatically calculate all that in the background. When I activated this billing contract earlier, what that does in the background is create a list of billing schedules. So you actually see the schedules of when you're expected to invoice, how much it's going to be and what date you're invoicing for. If we just go through the, some of the products and some of the, uh, the other abilities that the subscription billing can do, um, we've got four products on this contract. As you can see here, we've got four, uh, we've got billing types and there's three different billing types. So within our billing central subscription billing, we can apply three different types. The one off is pretty obvious. You bill it once. It's hardware. It's something that you're only going to bill it once um, and you're never going to bill it again. 
recurring fix is something like an engine or you know a subscription but it's a fixed amount so monthly quarterly annually you can you know you're going to bill it a fixed amount and then the third one is recurring variable which is a, a little bit like usage so you know you're going to bill them monthly but you're just not sure how much you're going to bill them and what we would do there is feed in usage records so uh, from whichever system or, you know, an upload via Excel, for example, you can feed in that they've used 50 units this month, 150 the month after. And you can also apply different pricing types as well. So we have tiered and volume. So, for example, if they go over 10 units, it's a certain price. 20 units is another price, um, et cetera. And we can apply that. The billing type is really important, but the same with billing term. So the billing term actually applies when you want to bill it. So one time is, again, pretty obvious. You can have annual, monthly, quarterly. And you can also have like monthly and start of the month. So as I said earlier, if you want to do start of the month, the proration will be applied. If you just want to do monthly and always bill on, you know, the seventh of the month, etc., you can have that as well. And what this is kind of displaying to you here is all within one contract, you can have multiple different things. So you're not set and you don't have to have like 18 contracts per customer. Um, you can have one contract and the different lines can do different things and have different billing terms, types. They can also have different start dates and end dates. So if, if one of your lines doesn't start for another six months, you can, you can put it on here, uh, push the start date out and it won't start billing that line for six months. So it's all about the flexibility and the control that you need to have. Uh, this is pretty cool at the top. It keeps a TCV. So as you're on the contract, you can just see what your TCV is. So what I'm going to do now from this billing contract is I'm actually going to create a sales invoice. Um, as I said before, when I activated it, it generates the billing schedules for me. And it can either be a daily job that automatically runs in the background to create the invoices for you, or you can come in, do it yourself on bulk or do it one by one. Um, for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to do it one by one. So I'm going to create a billing document and I'm going to actually say I want it to pick up everything up until the end of November. So what this is going to do here is pick up all the billing schedules that are up until the end of November and bill them. And I press create there and it builds it. But as I said earlier, this can be done automatically. I'm going to just go to the sales invoices now and we should have a sales invoice sat there for us. Sales invoice 405, 30th of 11th, which I just created. So if we click on the sales invoice, um, this is the sales invoice that would be sent out to the customer that has all the information on it. Um, some of the savvy people in the room will notice that there's only three lines on the sales invoice when the contract had four lines. The reason why that recurring variable line is missing is because I've not imported any usage for that recurring variable. So I've said that they've used nothing that month. So it's not going to build them. It's just going to leave them out. The same way would be with hardware. I haven't built that yet, but obviously the next month it comes across, it just won't bill it because it's only billed one off. Again, the whole thing about Salesforce and financial force and customer centricity is you have that audit trail all the way from the sales side all, all the way down to billing. So as you can see here, I'm one click away from moving back to that opportunity. The same way if I scroll to the right, I'm one click away from going back to that contract as well. So everything's connected in terms of the reporting that you can see, which I'll show you in a minute, everything's connected kind of together. So just before I move on to collections here, uh, while we're on kind of the subscription billing, I just want to show you an example of a dashboard that we can get out of um, the subscription billing. Um, when I showed you the homepage, I was sat on a CFO dashboard, but you can have many different dashboards saved in your background. And what a dashboard is, is just a collection of reports in visual representation. So this Billing Central SAS dashboard here just gives me some ideas of the contract TCV by customer. So I know maybe these are my top four customers and, you know, I really need to, you know, get that kind of customer satisfaction up there. Maybe we can do some extra add ons with them. Maybe we could kind of, you know, um, gun ho support with them, you know, give them a bit of love and affection because uh, they're kind of the big TCVs. You can have a list here of all the co new contracts that are coming in, set them up. 
uh, you've got products so as well I think it's quite important to know which products are sold how much your products are making whether it's actually worthwhile getting rid of a product stream because it's not making you any money or ones that you need to do better marketing on because it's not making you any money and all of these dashboards can give you that kind of great visibility great insight so you can make smarter decisions for your business as I said earlier Billing schedules, you can group them by month so you can see actually how much billing you're going to get per month and what you're expected to kind of go out the door. Um, so you can see per account here, we've got it grouped by, but overall you can see in May how much you're billing for. Again, you can do really cool stuff like upcoming renewals. So which ones we need to kind of get renewals. Maybe it goes back to sales to do the renewal and that can automatically come into finance or maybe finance do the renewals as well. Um, because I'm tight for time, I'm not going through any usage today, but again, you can run trends on usages to see, you know, if a customer is actually using something that they've signed up for or if they've gone three months without using anything. And again, all of these are one click away to drilling down into that raw data. So if you don't think something's right, maybe on one of these reports, you click on that link there and you go straight down into that raw data and um, what you need to do. While I'm on this dashboard, it is worth saying that these are really simple and easy to change. These are the kind of ones we provide you out of the box, but you just have to press edit there and kind of mess around with them. The, the people that already use Salesforce reports will know this is really simple, but it's clicks, not code to do it. And when, once you get used to it, it should take you a few minutes to kind of change a dashboard around, add an extra report that's really useful for your business in there as well. So I'm going to move on to collections now, which is the second bit of item two. And at Financial Force, we have something called Collections Workspace. So this workspace is basically one, a one-stop shop for the collections team to come in and work from, from their daily routine. Down the left-hand side is frequent tasks that the collections team need to do, like manage reminders, customer statements, go for their account. And if you click on this, like a create a task, it'll send you straight to that page. So this kind of workspace here um, gives them that visibility into what they need to do day by day. It's got some um, really cool kind of um, things at the top as well. So it can alert you. So if invoices are due in the last three days, if um, invoices are overdue, how many tasks you have to do today. And as I said earlier, if each credit controller has their own AR, uh, their own team of accounts that they they have they can have their own AR aging uh, just filtered by them so they can see you know this credit controller here is really good at their job everything's in current there's, there's a few that's outstanding there but I would be quite happy as that as a collections manager so this workspace is really useful for them and um, again as I said to click into all of their tasks one of the tasks that I want to show you today um, is the collections plus that we have so Collections Plus is sending out reminders and statements. You can set up here your own reminder rules. I've set up three for this um, demo today. So 15 days before due date, due today and 15 days after. But you can have as many as you want and set them up in your own rules. Basically what this does is based on these rules, it'll group all the invoices that it thinks needs to be sent and put, and put a mark on here. So as you can see, I've got 10 that are due today. And if I click on there, it drills down to the accounts that need to be sent. And then if I click up open, it opens up and shows me the sales invoices it wants to chase on. You can select and deselect. So if you just want to chase on that 11 million, you can select there or you can select all and send them across. You just have to press that button there and it will send the reminders. Or again, you can have that scheduled. So we're all about kind of hitting the automation. The same can go with customer statements. So in November, I've got six customer statements that I haven't sent out yet. It groups them here. If I click on them, it shows me the customers, the outstanding values that you've got, send the statements. So we're all within this kind of one screen, this one space. It makes your collections really simple rather than having to export Excel, write your own email templates every time. You know, all the chasing up can get really kind of an admin task and really hassle. This can just speed up the system and your collections team can actually start doing the job that they're there for and start being proactive rather than reactive. So again, while we're on collections, I just want to show another dashboard, which is a collections control dashboard here. And this is just a bit different to the SAS one. 
Um, it'll give outstanding balances, AR, open collections activity. Um, one that I think is really cool is this average days overdue here. So you can basically set up formatting to say who are bad payers, yellows are average payers, greens are good payers. So again, based on that DSO and average days to pay on the account, you can have these reports in the background that um, can provide to the collections team to know where to put their effort in and where they don't need to put their effort in. And then you can set up certain tasks. So per person, you can have certain tasks and activities in the system. So, you know, if you want to chase up certain accounts every day, every week, et cetera, um, you can have them. It is worthwhile saying as well, all the tasks and activities are all logged onto that customer account. So as a salesperson or as a manager, collections team, you have that list of tasks and activities. You can see who's assigned to it, when they were assigned, when they've completed it. So for example, if someone went off sick or on holiday, someone else in the collections team can pick that up and they can have the full history and visibility of what happened um, on that account, which again is really powerful rather than having to go through emails, right? Okay, so that's the end of kind of the billings collections. I'm now moving on to item three, which is the revenue recognition. So if I just move over into this tab, um, revenue recognition is just an extra tab that I've already loaded in the system. So again, you can still see I'm on the accounting app and I'm sat in recognize revenue. I'm running revenue recognition today on billing contracts, but you can run revenue recognition on whatever you want to in the system. So for example, we've got projects for our PSA application that we run it on. But we also have a list here of all the other objects. So if you don't use opportunities and you just want to, you know, input sales invoices or import sales invoices and you don't actually use the crm up front you can run revenue recognition based on your invoices as well what this does is you can filter so you can choose what you want to filter out what you want to filter in you put a recognition date and press generate data what this will do is go through the system find which billing contracts need to be um, included and recognized and provide a list here so I've opened up contract number 94, and as you can see, it's got three contract lines that need to go through revenue recognition. As David said before, each contract line can have their own template, which is their own calculation of how revenue recognition is run. So the first one and the last one is equal split. So again, if you remember earlier where we had them contract lines and they had start dates and end dates, it will split it equally based on the start dates and end dates. And then this one here is based on deliverable. So as soon as we, uh, as soon as the, it starts, we're going to actually um, deliver it and we need to recognize that revenue immediately. The third template that I don't have in here is percent complete. So you can do revenue recognition dependent on percent complete. And as well, just to highlight per contract, you can have multiple templates. So it gives you that flexibility again, based on your revenue streams that you have flowing through. Um, how you want to recognize revenue. It is worth pointing out while I'm in here is that there's no extra kind of um, manual interpretation that you need to do for revenue recognition. So as soon as that billing contract's created, you've already got the product that it's for, you've already got the start date and end date and how much it is. So it will do that calculation for you automatically. There's no extra manual steps to input things. As long as you've got the rules set up, right where you want to split it equally deliverable it will do it all for you and um, which again a lot of people at the moment are probably kind of exporting this to spreadsheets it takes a few hours a few days to run revenue recognition this can just run automatically in the background if you want to override the recognition values you just click in here and um, and basically what you've got this right hand side is the total revenue what's previously been recognized what it wants you to recognize this period and the total recognition in total. This kind of green stuff here is basically light green, it's what it wants you to recognize this period. If there was any dark green, it's what's previously been recognized, which is zero. And then all the white space is what's left. So what's left to be recognized, you know, in the next month, in the next year, etc. So you get that kind of um, um, one view there. And as well, we have the cost. So if you need to um, if you need to be um, compliant in IFRS 15 and amortize your costs, we can do that as well. Um, and that might be an extra discussion that we need to have separately. Um, but again, it's all automatic. It's all possible in this system. 
What you get out of this then is if you select and deselect, you get the record selected and how much revenue, and you just press submit there. What that submission does is creates the actual transaction for you. So it'll do the debit and the credit, you know, out of deferred income into your P&L, and it'll push that into the accounting finance as a journal. So again, without you having to import any journals or manually type them in, um, I know it can be a pain. It does it for you automatically. It's all connected. As you know, everything in this system is connected. So uh, that journal of the revenue recognition, you can do it by product, by account, by contract, by line. Um, so you can have that whole visibility and revenue recognition that you might not have currently. Currently, you might just do it per GL and on a summary basis. This will do it as detailed as you need it to, again, get them reports and help you make them better decisions. So while we're in here, um, I'll just go to an FMS dashboard um, to provide you some insight in what the revenue recognition can do. It's worthwhile saying you can do revenue forecasts the same way you can do revenue recognition. So if all your contracts or all your invoices, for example, or all your opportunities are in the system, you can forecast based on them as well. Um, so it's not just the recognized revenue that runs. Some example reports here is revenue recognized by date. So you can see how much revenue is coming in each month, um, which I think is really useful to look at kind of your peaks and troughs. You can see trend by account. So if you actually want to do it per customer account and the trend and the revenue that they're doing, you can do it by type. So if you have multiple different areas that you want to run revenue recognition over, um, and it, it's worthwhile saying here you can do prepayments as well. So if you wanted to run it over your accounts payable side, you can do that as well. This is one report that I wanted to highlight, which is actu uh, forecast versus actuals. So you can see here, why are my actuals so much higher than my forecasts? What, why didn't I think the forecasts were going um, okay? You know, why didn't we know about it up front, et cetera? And you can see them contracts versus actuals. And then there's just some stuff at the bottom that's giving you kind of your deferred balances, GL, uh, how much you've recognized per date in the system, which is a nice little number, and forecast per customer as well. Uh, as you all know, I've said it before, on each dashboard, you can drill down into the individual reports um, and you can group this revenue recognition by what you want, right? So again, by product, by contract number, um, by type, and the forecast can do exactly the same as well, um, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, great. So I'm moving on to accounts payable now. Um, so because we're kind of strapped for time, I'm not actually going to go through... Um, I'm not going to go through how we create payable invoices, um, but there's multiple different ways you can do that, right? So we have a purchase ordering system, so you can do your PO receipting, vouchering, um, and that can automatically create payable invoices. You can upload them from Excel, um, you can kind of put them onto the system, they sell via input, and payable invoices are kind of really straightforward. You can have the same approval processes um, if you have different approval processes. And, and as well, we have dimensions in the system, right? So as well as the general ledger chart of account, we have cost centers um, or dimensional analysis. So you can, offer, you can split things out by cost center, by region, by person, if you wanted to do expenses that way, et cetera. Um, but if you needed more information on that, that would probably kind of be separate to this. What I want to show you for this is um, Payments Plus. So this is all the payable invoices are already in the system. And I actually want to run a payment run today. So I'm saying as of today, I want to run an electronic payment run. So I've just put in that I'm in the UK company and I'm just going to run it on this control account, accounts payable here. But you have the option to filter this by what you want. So if you want to only go up to a certain due date, if you want to only you know, select a certain account, if you select a certain vendor invoice number, you can filter by whatever you want. And then you just press retrieve transactions. What this does is bring back all the payable invoices in the system that should be paid up until today. This one at the top has got a little lock sign because you can put payable invoices on hold if you don't want to pay them and you can release for payments. Then you can go around selecting and deselecting. You can part pay. So if you want to change the value there, you can change the value and you can see which account, which payable invoices you need to pay for, how much they are, when they're due, et cetera. And then basically it's going through, selecting uh, what you need to, and then pressing pay. So you add to proposal, it will 
it will calculate the proposal value up there. Um, from here, once the payment is um, proposed, you can then download a bank file and upload that into your bank account um, automatically. So you can say, you know, an XML file, CSV file, however you need that file to be for your bank account. Um, we can actually create that file for you. You upload it to the bank, do all your approvals in the bank. And then once that's done, you'll actually come back here and you would submit this payment. Um, again, we'd go through an implementation, what stages you needed to do everything. Um, that's just kind of a quick high level view of our payment plus screen. Um, as I said, it's kind of one screen where you can select, deselect and create the payments um, total, which I think again is really simple, really quick to use. So just to remind you, um, I know you all know now, but we have an accounts payable dashboard. Um, so this just highlights some other things that you can have from the AP side. So you can have, uh, you can look at your invoices um, by account and see which ones have been approved. You can see which, when they're due, when they're overdue, um, how many are in progress and complete. So in progress might mean that they still need to be approved that someone's kind of taking their time. So you might want to drill down into that and see, you know, is it a certain department that hasn't approved them? And then you can see how many posted payments you've got. So how many payments have gone through for what account? So you can actually, you know, BT are getting a lot from us here. Uh, so are the Office uh, Depot UK, et cetera. You can start knowing which ones are your best suppliers, maybe where your procurement team need to kind of go in and make better rates, et cetera. Um, you can have all that visibility in this dashboard here. Okay, so as I know we've got about 10 minutes left, um, I really want to move on to the last item today, which is the reporting. Because um, I think this is, uh, this is brilliant in the system. Um, it highlights what the, what the system can do because of the reports that you can get out the background. So I'm not going to highlight too much on any more dashboards because I think you've all kind of got it in your head now what dashboards are available in that kind of out of the box, how you can edit them, how the reports underneath look. Um, and again, each one's kind of drillable. We also have our reporting in the system so you can run, you know, income statements versus budgets and GL transactions, detailed trial balance, etc. Uh, the one thing I want to move on to is Einstein. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Einstein, but Salesforce have like invested billions and billions into Einstein recently. And it's kind of their new reporting tool, um, which is like an AI kind of BI kind of powerful tool really um, in reporting. Obviously, because Financial Force is built on the platform, we can take advantage of that and we can just input our information into Einstein um, and use the kind of investment they're giving um, and we can kind of build on that as well. So I just want to highlight a few of the reports that we have in our Einstein um, and the different ways we're kind of looking at reporting now. So this is a subscription booking example. And what you can see here is based on these dates, I've already put the dates in, it gives us a starting MRR and it gives you an ending MRR. And in between, it shows you what the churn is, what the downsell is, what the net news are, um, what the upsells, et cetera. And it gives you all the contracts underneath. And again, you one click away into that contract. You can do certain things down this right hand side. So in terms of filtering, you can say, actually, I want, only want to look at um, the manufacturing industry and how we're doing there. And you can just filter it and it'll update all your kind of starting MRR, ending MRR, et cetera. And you get these kind of cool values at the top that says what it's doing. And you can also do it by customer account. So if you wanted to see how well your accounts are doing, um, et cetera, you can. And then you can click on, for example, net news. And then what it does there is filter by the three net new contracts that are in the system. You can filter back out and it'll show everything that's going through. So this just gives you that kind of really good visibility into really like the um, journey that you've gone on in terms of your subscription billing. And a lot of people don't do this reporting or if they do, it's all always offline in spreadsheets. But this is a standard report that you can get from Financial Force. Um, another thing that I want to go over into is the CFO overview, but just before I do that, for the, all the accountants in the room, I do want to highlight that we do have income statements, balance sheets that you can export, import, et cetera on here. Um, so if I just concentrate on a balance sheet one, uh, we've, we've got the sections grouped like this, year to date, last year to date, variance, et cetera. The really cool thing again is the filters at the uh, right hand side. 
So at the moment, this is a multi-company balance sheet. But if I said, actually, I would only want, oh, sorry. If I said, actually, I only want to do it based on limited, I can just click limited. And you can see within a few seconds there, I've got a balance sheet via limited. And then if I say, right, I want to go back to all again, it does it via all. If I wanted to look at the previous year, I just click 2018 and it changes all the values to the previous year. And then again, if I wanted to look at, you know, only up to period 11 instead of 12, you can click and drop them there. You can change your dual currencies, home currencies, you know, depending on how you report it. Um, and again, if you wanted to know what the accounts receivable is made up of, you just click in there, drill down to the selected GLA, and you've got all your transactions listed there of what that value makes up of. So again, one click away on that balance sheet and down to your transactional level, which is really kind of cool. Same when you've got income statement, you've got trial balance, you've got a transactional list. So we have all that kind of really, you know, simple counting stuff. Uh, what I just want to go over quickly for the last few minutes is the CFO overview dashboard in Einstein. And this is kind of where I get kind of weirdly excited because I think this is really cool in the system that we can do. So we've got a CFO overview. We've got profitability, which is your revenue, gross margin, operating expenses, EBITDA. And we're comparing it to the previous years. So these things up at the top here is just compared to previous years. Within one click, you can compare it to budget if you needed to. And again, you've got the same stuff here. So you can change from multi-company. You can change the frequency to quarterly. You can change based the year, et cetera. You've got all that cool stuff still there. Same thing on balance sheet. So you've got AR, DSO, accounts payable, cash and equivalents. So just to show you the drillability, um, on operating expenses, if I th thought that looked a bit weird, I could go into here and I could actually see operating expenses based on department. If I said, oh, marketing looks a bit weird, I can just click on marketing. And as you can see, it filtered this report on the right hand side based on marketing. And I can see, you know, the actuals was pretty good apart from period 10. Something went crazy there. What did we do in period 10? You can click view details. And again, you're down to them journals that make up that marketing, um, that marketing balance. So you can see, oh, yeah, I forgot we did X, Y, Z in Chicago, um, which was all of it. Now let's look at the consulting and you can get the consulting journal and again, go through all the departments. So the last thing that I'm going to show you, which is kind of the new technology, is all this kind of AI, uh, AI sorry, learning um, kind of trend prediction. So I'm going to show you it based on revenue. But as you can see, we've got it based on more or less everything here it's on AR, um, on AP, et cetera. If I click on trend prediction in revenue, it basically will predict based on the learning and everything that's in the system, what your revenue is going to be like in the future. So you can have here, um, I've got it up to 2019 and then um, forecasting onwards. You can switch seasonality on and off. So if you want to see it based on on and off, you can forecast just to three periods instead of 12. And um, some of the kind of crazy stuff it can show is cool. Um, if we go back to 12, what it actually gives you on each period is an upper and lower bound as well. So it can basically, you can actually forecast, you know, best case, worst case, et cetera, and get all that forecast in. And just the same way you can filter on everything else, if you want to filter by a certain product, um, et cetera, you've got all that in the system. So I just wanted to highlight as the last thing that Einstein Analytics, um, as I said, Salesforce is investing loads into this. Currently, new stuff's coming out all the time. We're releasing new stuff all the time on this. Um, so this is really going to be the reporting tool where we put in our effort and bring kind of like uh, more out of the box reports and things on it. And as you can see, it's going into that new world of like the intelligent learned behavior on there. So I talk really fast. I've gone through a lot there. Uh, I've not been interrupted throughout. And um, I know you've been through a lot today and um, then five items that we said to go through. Um, so thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. If you put any questions in the in the chat um, and back over to you, David. Hi, Sam. Thanks very much, Sam. Just don't um, stop sharing your screen yet. If you can just hang on one second. Oh, sorry. I, was... sorry. <laughs> I wasn't quick enough. <laughs> um, yeah, just a couple of points. I mean, the demo was great. Um, it, it was fantastic. Just a couple of things I just want to point out to everybody. I mean, obviously, we've got limited time today. Um, when we were deciding what content we were going to share, we really want to focus on really demonstrating that financial force is kind of a, a very much a next generational accounting tool. So we showed a lot of the 
the automation, a lot of processing around bulk, etc. Um, we haven't showed you how to go in and create an invoice. We kind of feel that that's kind of assumed functionality, but trust me, you can just go in and create an invoice if you want to. <laughs> uh, so that's obviously, yeah, if that's something you want to pick up later on, um, you know, we definitely can do. The other thing to point out once again is that, you know, as I highlighted at the start, the product is modular. So you might have seen this demo and you might have seen like one thing that you think, okay, that's great, that's fantastic, that would really help us, but actually, we don't need all this other stuff or it's not applicable to us or the way that we work. You know, we, we wouldn't necessarily need to, to use that. Um, because it's modular, you wouldn't have to actually have that module if you didn't want to, you know, the module with that specific functionality that you didn't need. So do that, do bear that in mind. If you look at this and think it's almost a little bit overwhelming in terms of the, the level of functionality, um, you don't have to have everything. You know, you could just have FFA uh, with some of the functionality in FFA, Financial Force Accounting, um, and not have anything to do with subscription and billing or, or not have Einstein if you didn't want to. So do bear that in mind. Um, and then, yeah, so Sam, I asked you obviously not to, not to stop sharing. Can you just dive back over to the second tab? You've got the Accounts Payable Dashboard. And can you just go into Accounts? Because we had one question about Accounts from Antoine, um, which I just wanted to highlight, just, just to make sure everybody understands kind of how this is all working. So at the moment, Sam's sharing the screen there, which is the account page layout. Now, if you've got Salesforce, it probably looks a little bit different. The reason being, because this is, at, this is accessed through the Financial Force Accounting um, application, it is using a specific page layout. So that's what might look a little, little bit different to your accounts um, layout. What you've got at the top there are the related list quick links. And the question from Antoine was, what was the project tab there? So I just wanted to sort of highlight how this all works. Okay, so this is essentially the same um, record as your account record in Salesforce if you're just using Sales Cloud. If you can just click on related really quickly, Sam. Down a bit, next to details. Bottom left, that one, yeah. So we can see here all of the related items. Um, so all the items that are related to the accounts. Now, typically, if you're just using Sales Cloud, you might things like see things like opportunities and contracts in here. But obviously, if you just stop there, Sam, you can see projects. Now, the reason you can see projects there is because this demo that Sam's using has PSA installed in it, and it has some PSA data in it. So in answer to your question, Antoine, that's what the projects are. These are PSA projects. Um, and, and that kind of highlights what I said earlier about all the data being linked. So when you create, you know, if you've got, uh, for example, a close on opportunity, you need to spin up a project, it's linked back to the account. So you can report on what projects are running under which accounts. Um, uh, you know, similarly with finance data, you can report obviously on which invoices are being raised again, which accounts. So, uh, so yeah, I hope that answers your question, Antoine. Yeah, and it's probably worthwhile saying as well, um, you can set up obviously profiles and permissions. So if you don't want someone to be able to see projects, so they don't work in the project management space, they have, you know, they'd never need to see it. You set up a profile that they just don't have access to it. So they're not even aware that it's in the system. Same on finance. Obviously, you don't want everyone to be able to see all your finance information. So that's just based on licensing, but it's also on profiles and permissions and what they can see. Okay, great. Um, Nick, next question we had coming in was from uh, was from Eva. Um, how would Financial Force work with customers with many billing entities? Sales don't know which company will be billing, so they create sales opportunity, Salesforce opportunity on the main client account. So this is a this is a tricky one. Um, this is a tricky one from a process standpoint. There's a number of ways this can be dealt with on the platform using financial force. Um, so sort of typically we'd want to know why uh, the, when the sales guys are selling something, they kind of don't know exactly which account they're selling it to. So, you know, first of all, we'd like if possible to try and get that aligned and get that data correct when you close with an opportunity. But, you know, if that wasn't a possibility, um, then it would be obviously depending on how financial force integrated with sales cloud in this example, 
um, it could be dealt with with just a, a fairly light customization to allow you to assign the correct account at a later date. Okay, um, I hope that answered the question. But yeah, I, sort of ideally, you know, we, we'd, we'd want somebody to really sort of justify exactly why it was that they didn't know who they were selling to. Um, so yeah. Uh, next question that we had coming in was from Alex, which was related to Spanish billing versus UK billing. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the intricacies of the question, Alex. Um, I don't know whether or not you'd be able to jump on and explain that to us. Um, if if uh, Sarah, if you could, um, if you could unmute Alex, Alex, would you be able to explain that to us? Okay, all right. Um, I'm gonna, Alex, interrupt me if you have the ability to um, to speak on the microphone, but if not, um, I'll just kind of explain kind of potentially how I think that might uh, be resolved. So, um, you know, Finance Force is highly customizable. Um, if you're billing in a specific way for a, you know, for a specific entity and then you were to start using Finance Force for a different entity, um, you know, we'd be able to set up different billing profiles, um, you know, different billing templates, so different invoice templates, should I say. Uh, so it really wouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, if there was a completely different workflow, we'd probably want to know what that new workflow would be when we did the implementation. But, um, but like I said, the platform is extremely flexible, um, so it's unlikely that there would be any problems there. Okay. Uh, we had another question from... Either around um, collection statements and email rules for different customers. Um, so yeah, so basically the question is, could you exempt some customers from receiving statements and emails? Um, you know, as part of the automated process for collections. Uh, and yes, you could. Yeah, like I say, you know, fairly, fairly simple customization. Um, something which could be managed at pretty much any level if you wanted to. So, you know, perhaps you might want to specify at the account level that somebody doesn't receive statements um, and then potentially give the opportunity to override that um, at a later date somewhere in the workflow. Okay. Um, and then we've just got another question come in here from Srindi. Um, can I have a look at ledger postings for a particular invoice? Sam? Have we got any invoices where you can show us some transactions? I'm sure I do. Like I say, it's a good question, Srindy, because like I say, we've been showing all this kind of really whizzy next generational functionality and, uh, and we've got accountants on the line who just want to see what uh, journals look like. Yeah, sure. So um, when your invoice is made, it actually goes to a transaction and it's the exact same way that like cash, journals, payable invoices, every all them documents will all go down to a transaction. And um, this transaction basically is what makes up the GL. So that's the post into the GL. So if I just click on that transaction there, you can see them GLs. So it's um, AR, obviously it's a debit. It, this is automatically set to go to deferred um, because we're running revenue recognition, obviously. And then that's the um, that as well. And they're all separated out. So the, the GL, that's the kind of posting in and out there. Okay, great, Sam. All right, thanks. Okay, well, I've just realised we've, we've run five minutes over the time allotted for the webinar. Sam, if you just want to stop sharing your screen. Yep. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. Um, you know, once again, thanks again to Sam for sparing the time to be able to do the demo for us today. Uh, so what we're going to do next is we'll be contacting all of you for, um, for some feedback on the demo. Um, we'd like to understand really which bits that you liked and thought were applicable to your business and actually which bits that you didn't think were applicable to your business. Um, if you want to, in the meantime, you can reach out directly to me. My contact details are there on the screen, but we'll obviously send them out to you as well. Um, and then, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thanks for all the questions, very good questions. And uh, I hope you all have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.